The Retirement Cafe podcast, episode two, A Life in Funerals with Ken West, MBE, the founder of the Natural Burial Movement. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. He is your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. In this episode, we hear how, at 15, Ken West started his career planting up cemetery graves. Maybe a strange career choice for a young lad, but one driven by a deep interest in horticulture. This was the start of Ken's 45-year-long career in bereavement services. Ken has been involved in over 100,000 funerals, from managing graveyards to crematorium to local authority funeral services. As his knowledge of the reality of traditional funerals grew, Ken's interest in natural burial also grew. In 1993, he created the revolutionary Green Funeral Market, where he opened the world's first natural burial site in Carlisle, which is spreading worldwide. Ken is widely recognised as the country's leading expert in the movement. Over 45 years of work, Ken improved the burial situation for stillbirths unchanged since the 1850s and for fetal remains wrote the Charter for the Bereaved, introduced the reusable coffin for cremation and created techniques for reducing pollution from cremation. In 2001, Ken was awarded the MBE for his contribution to bereavement services. Only on his retirement in 2006 did Ken put his vast knowledge and experience of bereavement services to paper where he published his first two books. The first, A Guide to Natural Burial, is deemed to be the go-to manual for anyone wanting to understand the funeral and natural burial market or take control of their own funeral arrangements. The second is a novel entitled R.I.P. Off, or The British Way of Death. It provides a unique insight into the world of death and funerals that readers cannot gain by any other means. R.I.P. Off explores how death has had a significant environmental and social impact and shows how people deal with death in a myriad of ways. Here's my interview with Ken West, MBE, on the Retirement Cafe podcast. So today I'd love to welcome Ken West, MBE, to the Retirement Cafe podcast. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Justin. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, spending some time with us today. Now, Ken, um, for the benefit of the audience, obviously we know each other, but for the benefit of the audience... um, you're retired now, um, but you had a very successful career. So tell me a little bit about that and what it was involved in. My career, it was 45 years in bereavement services. Wow. Um, so if I, if I look back to that, um, I started that work as a horticultural trainee working in a cemetery at Shrewsbury. Right. So what was that, about 18, was it? Or I was 15. 15. It was wow. my 15th birthday. Right. I was 14 years and 10 months when I got the job. Okay. Um, and I'm trained virtually in Victorian horticulture, you know, quite an a old-fashioned way now, and, and bluntly not much use since then. Right. Um, I'm pricking out maybe 30,000 plants a year. Right. It can be dreadfully boring. Yeah. And then the boss said, um, you can move on, you can change your job if you want to. So I could move to being the cemetery sexton. That meant I received all the funerals coming into the cemetery. Then I became a cremator operator. So as a young man, that's, that's quite an odd choice of career. It is, except that um, the environment always interested me. Right. The horticulture interested me. So you're always in that scene. You're managing extensive grounds or you're working with extensive grounds. So there's always something going on outdoors usually. Right. So it's quite a healthy sort of work. Um, and then on top of that, you're meeting people. Yeah, yeah. So you're dealing with death from an early age, really? Literally. Um, it was just all funerals. I dealt with over 100,000 funerals wow. um, over my lifetime in one way or another. And it started off by me planting up somebody's grave yeah. uh, in the cemetery and goes right through to me cremating and then through to doing the administration, the legal work on forms and whatever. So, yeah, a very interesting and wide, varied work. And now, of course, your expertise really is around natural burials. So tell me, how how did that that come about? That expertise really was 30 years when I first thought about natural burial. 
it went back to starting work in 1961, and I'm working with the last cemetery scythers. People don't recall these people anymore. These would be 80-year-old men who would come in on a sit-up and beg bicycle. They would have a carborundum stone in a holster and a scythe, and you would expect them to scythe an acre a day. Okay. That was the general uh, state of things. And so they, they, these are preparing graves, are they? Preparing the, no, these graves? are working on the old parts of the cemetery, the Victorian ah, parts, okay. probably 30 or 40 acres. They would scythe from one side to the other. As they scythed, a cloud of butterflies would be around them. They'd displace voles on the floor. There'd be um, butterflies everywhere, as I'd said. And we had a barn owl. Right. Everywhere had a barn owl. Every cemetery and churchyard had a barn owl because of that terrain. And of course, as they moved across the cemetery, the wildflowers were, were cut down in front of them, but grew behind them. Right. You had that sequential um, growth in the cemetery, which was particularly healthy, very healthy environment. I remembered that. And then my boss became infatuated with chemicals, herbicides, 2,4-T, chemicals which were being used by the Americans in Vietnam to defoliate trees. Right. We used them to control the herbage. We bought in American um, petrol mowers, rotary mowers as we would call them. Yeah. So now we can be masters of our own destiny. We can be tidy. And that tidiness mantra took off. So all those wild areas in cemeteries, churchyards, grass, verges disappeared. The barn owls went with them. Right. The, the whole uh, um, ecosystem collapsed. But nobody noticed. You know, even when I look back now, I'm, I'm shocked that I must have noticed, but, but not specifically. Yeah. Then I spent maybe the next 10 or 15 years experimenting with wildflower conservation in the cemeteries I managed. Right. Wolverhampton, um, then up to Carlisle. Then I get it to a, 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 um, a fine tea, really. I've got about 20 acres of wildflower meadow growing in the cemetery, all on graves that are no longer visited. The deer are coming back in, hair numbers are going up, hedgehog numbers are coming up, the tawny owls come back. Then after I left there, the barn owls are back. So you could see, you suddenly understood that you could bring the environment back. All it took was a bit of expertise. And to prove that, sometimes for lunch break, I'd eat my lunch, I'd go for a walk in the cemetery, I'd walk over one of these areas, I'd come out on the other side and my black shoes had turned golden with the pollen off the flowers. Lovely. Something that you just wouldn't experience. No. Um, we did a lot of cemetery walks then. We got quite a lot of media coverage because of the, the quality of the wildflowers that came up. And then people started saying to me on cemetery walks, I'd love to be buried in that area. Can I be? I'd say, no, I'm sorry, you can't. The graves aren't available. But my mind is then working on, we need a, a different kind of environmental burial, one that essentially is the environment first, human funeral needs second. And so I was um, working on my DMS, a Diploma of Management Studies at um, um, uh, Middlesbrough. So how old were you then? I was 45. 45, right. Um, I've got a two-year uh, study course for the uh, DMS. Um, marketing is one of the subjects. Um, I think to myself, I could put this project in, this natural burial project, can be one of my marketing uh, so how papers. Do you, how would you define a natural burial then, so, so for, the, for our listeners, how would, how would you kind of you know, describe that in, in, its, in its first description? In, in a sense, you can define it the way you want to within the perspective of the kind of land that you're putting it on. Right. So you might want to create forest, you might want to create forest with wildflowers so that you then have forest edge. Woodland edge is the richest habitat of all. Right. But you may well want it to be an orchard in which you're growing apples. There's, there's one site where they put in all the threatened apple species and those apple trees go on top of the person's grave. So you can, you can, you can measure it to fit the environment. What Carlisle wanted was an oak uh, woodland to improve air quality. Right. It was quite specific. We want to improve air quality. We need to plant oak trees. And I can say, well, within natural burial, people will come in and they'll pay us to put these oak trees on the grave. We'll underplant them with English bluebells. They'll slowly go back to forest. Um, and, and we'll see how people feel with that. It doesn't matter to us whether two people come in 
or 200 people coming. And was Carlisle one of the first ones you established? It was the first. The first, right. They accepted my feasibility study in 1990, 1990 right. and then didn't come up with the money. So we had to find ways. We employed uh, volunteer, voluntary groups to do the work for us. And we opened a site in 1993. And what does that site look like today? It looks like an oak forest. Wow. Unbelievably. A lot of criticism at the time. A number of even tree experts would say, you can't, you can't get oak trees growing like that, almost as if you're, you're just running a garden. But you can. And the oak trees went in. Um, and in fact, I own two graves there. So it, one of those graves is for me when the time comes. Um, we put the oak trees in there as, as very small transplants. Uh, you know, they're only about two feet high. Yeah. But they immediately establish. Ten years later, 15 years later, they, they're throwing up acorns. And a complete environment has developed under there. The bluebells have developed. And so they're still continuing to do the burials today. And it's probably extending to about 10 acres of oak forest at the moment. Wow. And so how many um, burial plots would be in an area like 10, acre, 10 acres? You, you would go by the acre. The, the typical grave pattern for an acre, say, of uh, traditional graves is 1,000 graves to the acre. Okay. Uh, we were looking at something like 600 to 700. We needed to give a bit more space uh, for the trees, um, and that includes your footpaths between. Um, and we changed all that with woodland burial. We obviously don't want paving in there. We don't want concrete in as much as possible. Try and keep the whole site as natural as we can um, so that um, it's the environment that prospers. So, um, I mean, a lot of people may not even be aware of what a natural burial, that it's, that it's available. So, um, you know, how do people... How do people, you know, I see lots of people's you know, letters of wishes and, and wills, etc. And, they, you know, it's a cremation or it's a burial or what have you. But nothing else is, is possibly not much more thought has gone into it other than that. Um, so how do people find out about natural burial sites? Why would it be of a benefit to people? Or, you know, tell me about your, I mean, you're, you've gone through a thought process of actually choosing your own, you know, your own plot now um, at the at the early age of 72. Um, so tell me about, you know, how, how would someone find out about sites in their area and why would that be a benefit to them? Yeah, there's a, there's a mass of questions there, really. The first thing is people, there's about 300 natural burial sites operating now. Wow. Some of them are quite small and they're parts of cemeteries and whatever. And the concept's gone worldwide. It's, it, it's expanding in America and Australia and New Zealand. Right. Um, principally, you would go to, say, the Natural Death Centre or the Good Funeral Guide. They're right. both on the internet. Right. Lots of information there. Um, you could also just do a search on Google. Right. It will pick up your local natural burial sites. Most people are within 10 or 20 miles. And then what I'd say to people is, first of all, you need to be comfortable with it. But the point is, if you're somebody who's interested, say, in bees, birds, trees, the countryside in general, wildflowers, any form of wildlife... Why would you want to waste your body with cremation? Because that's what you do. Okay. You put your body into a situation where it's incinerated, it's wasted. But here with natural burial, you're sequestering the body. 18% of it is carbon. You're locking it up in the soil. And then over the next 30, 40, 50 years, it will be broken down naturally. There's no worms. You don't get worms or maggots in bodies. It's a complete misnomer. Okay. And then the body slowly breaks down and it will be absorbed into those trees and plants on the site. That's now a proven fact that our molecules, our atoms, are actually found in plants after maybe 40 to 50 years from burial. Wow. So in a sense, you do become one with the environment. Now, of course, there are problems with that. You would want the site not to be too tidy. If you're growing trees and you've got wildflowers around, you want those wildflowers to go through their summer sequence. They need to grow, flower, all the insects that are around there. And if I went into a natural burial site, say I went in in July or August, I would expect to hear crickets. And I will hear it. If I was judging a site, I'd immediately say, if I hear the crickets, I know I've got a good site. You don't hear crickets in gardens or parks or most places these days. No. So there are indicator species that tell you that you've got a good environment. Right. Good environment for those burials is a good environment for the living as well. Now, saying all of that, of course, it's that untidiness that some people might find difficult. 
at the end of the season, say in September or October, I may well run a mower through the site and it would be tidy right through the winter. If I'm growing trees, I would expect the trees to be properly protected against deer and whatever. And I would also expect, and this is what people I think need to search for when they go on their sites, is that the site has objectives. What's it there for? You know, is it growing trees? Is it looking towards improving air pollution? Is it looking to encourage owls or deer? And it's quite important that the site owner knows what they're doing right. and are managing the site properly. And then when you go in the site, you'd expect transparency. So can anyone, I mean, how does one set up a, a natural burial site? I mean, is that, is it, is it, is it a huge amount of legislation around it or can anyone do it? That's an interesting question, Justin, because until I started natural burial um, in 1993, nobody opened a cemetery. Every cemetery is a deficit operation and huge deficits because of the maintenance costs. Long term, you, huge, you lose a huge sum of money. But I identified natural burial as 80% reduction in maintenance. Now the private sector come in. And for the first time in anyone's experience, the private sector are now saying, here's a new product. Unfortunately, they're often identifying that product for the sort of discerning middle classes. And it's quite high priced, so it isn't necessarily cheap. But a lot of farmers and charities came in immediately thinking, I'm running a sheep farm. I'm making losses every year. Why can't I do these natural burials and I can still keep the sheep on top of the graves? Higher Meadow down near Bemster, Beamster, is a typical site like that. Um, and she opened up the site and then all of a sudden realized it's, 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 it's a simple matter of planning permission from the local council. There were no facilities when she first opened up, but latterly she's put up, a, she spent a hundred thousand pounds on an all oak chapel. And then she simply starts doing the burials on her meadows. Some of those burials include a tree and those trees are designed to fit the local environment. They're on chalk. So it would probably be beech and certain other trees wouldn't suit the chalk. She allows the, uh, the herbage to grow, but she brings her sheep on. And so people get used to seeing that new kind of environment and she's slowly expanding. Because she found that many funeral directors wouldn't tell people about what she was doing, that she widened her remit website to tell people what's going on, but also she became her own funeral director. So basically, she would then go in anywhere into Dorset, pick up a body, take it back, keep it at the site. Then the family simply go there for the funeral. She would want to use, because we want your body to naturally biodegrade, either it would be cardboard or wicker or any other natural product that will slowly break down um, when it gets in the grave. And so long term, of course, the body and the, um, the coffin is going to break down and disappear. There's no huge Victorian memorial sitting over the top. There's no health and safety problems. And ultimately, although we'll need legislation to do this, you would expect in maybe 75 or 100 years, she'll simply go back to those graves and rebury again after 100 years. It's a perpetual operation. And so uh, just picking up on your point there about um, why would a funeral director not be letting people know about um, this, this, this option? That, in a way, was my naivety. Uh, you know, I was fairly fixated on the environment when I started Natural Burial, saw it as an option for people and, and immediately got a lot of support from organic gardeners and beekeepers and people. Um, I didn't realize, of course, that I was really validating cardboard coffins. I was validating not having your body embalmed and filled up with carcinogenic chemicals. I, I didn't really think about that. So, of course, funeral directors are not giving me very much support. And I go to one of their regional meetings, which I would do anyway, normally, because I'm running the burial and cremation facilities. And then it's really unpleasant. And I was slated as wanting to destroy the funeral directing profession. Subsequently, I was slated for destroying memorial masonry because I'm effectively stopping people having these memorials, which people see as having historical value. In fact, they don't because nobody goes back to them. And then the florist, of course, got upset because we would even take it so far as to say, we don't really want hothouse flowers. They're, they're being imported on, on planes. They're being grown um, by women working in greenhouses in Africa and places where they're not looked after. 
We hear of abortions from the chemicals used to grow the plants. So ultimately, you suddenly find yourself opposed to the traditional funeral, opposed to memorial masonry, opposed to floristry. It's just about the whole business. Particularly unpopular. <laughs> Particu <laughs> particularly unpopular. And then subsequently it got worse because a number of people who really attacked me were people I knew well who were cremationists. And I suddenly realized there'd be no attack in a way on cremation for well over 100 years. You know, cremation started in 1884. It didn't take off itself until the 1950s and 1960s when I started in the work. That was the big building movement by local councils to increase crematoria because we all thought there's no future for burial. But the trouble is that cremation was brought in. Nobody thought about it being incineration, the pollution that would come from it, the use of the finite fuel and uh, all of those issues. Um, and so now it's only now, of course, where air pollution really is a problem. I mean, we're the second most air polluted country in Europe um, that something had to be done about cremation. Uh, so initially they are arresting mercury. They have a, an abatement process. It arrests mercury. But it's not there to arrest the dioxins or the chlorides or any of the other substances which so come off. this is off. the environmental option now for the, for the, for the really, for the, the environmental choice, isn't it, uh, for the future, I would have thought? At the moment it is. Some people will argue that we haven't got the space. Um, and within the industry, most people would be saying, yes, but there is a proposal for grave reuse. It's been sitting with government for over 20 years, mm. um, that we've got to go back into cemeteries and churchyards where a grave has been lying there for over 100 years. And we would immediately go to the family, if there are any, any contacts that we've got, and say, do you want to keep ownership of this grave? If you don't, we'll reuse it. Mm. And there is a proposal to remove the bones that will exist, that's all there will be, is a few bones, sink them deeper in the grave, do two more burials. No reason why that cemetery or churchyard can't be run on natural burial principles, because in a sense, that's how churchyards always were run. Um, you know, when you went into a churchyard, they, they continued reburying over the top. I once cleared a churchyard in Wolverhampton, and it had to be cleared, it's now a road traffic island. Right. And the contractors come in and, and they're saying, how deep do we need to go? And, and you're saying, how long's a piece of string? And the digger actually went down 21 feet, 7 meters. And there was something like eight levels of burial down to the bottom. And of course, they, they'd done the first burial. What do we do with the soil? We dump it over some of the old graves over that part. They'd ultimately bury across the churchyard, go over to the other side, do more burials. It had gone on like that for 150 years. Um, so, in a sense, natural burial can see that principle coming back. Sure, sure. But I think, uh, as obviously, the, the sites, um, like you mentioned, in Carlisle, actually growing oak trees and creating forests as well, I mean, hugely impactful for a positive way for the environment. Uh, indeed. I think that where Carlisle were quite far-sighted, really, was because the cemetery was next to a country park, we'd effectively said, let's develop this field into natural burial, There'll come a point, maybe in a hundred years, maybe much less, where it can be seeded into the country park. Absolutely no reason why people can't go picnicking in a natural burial site in amongst the trees. No. You know, you could even have children's play areas in there. It becomes ridiculous that cemeteries somehow are seen as abhorrent to, um, you know, people, mm. whereas they can be integrated. There's no reason why a country park of any sort couldn't do natural burial. No. It, it wants wildflower meadow. No reason why that wildflower meadow couldn't be graves. And is this a is this a more expensive choice? Do you think that's is that got anything to do with with the popularity of it? I think that that is the problem that people will find when they go searching for sites. Right. Some sites are run by quite big companies now, running maybe seven or eight sites, and they will charge you for a grave according to the view, the quality of the view. Right. We're not quite sure who's looking at the view. <laughs> and they, a grave might range from 3,000 up to 7,000 pounds, quite right. expensive. Okay. But then you can go to a charity site or a farm site and you can get um, a grave down to probably 1,500 pounds, 2,000 okay. pounds. Um, and it's for you, of course, to decide what it is you like. Those expensive sites will usually have a very attractive chapel 
Um, they will be often very environmental. All the heating will be done by wood chip. They may be, I can think of one site where they're removing all the pine trees on the site and replacing those with deciduous trees. The Forestry Commission have told them to do that. So they're slowly burning the um, pine trees as they cut them down. And the site is full of deer. You know, even while you're having a ceremony, a funeral ceremony in the chapel, the deer are actually outside feeding in the forest while you're having the service. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Well, that's been um, thoroughly interesting, Ken, for learning all about something that I really didn't know much about at all. And I'm sure um, many of our listeners will be um, enthralled in all that. Now, um, I'm just going to quickly touch on a book that you wrote um, called A Rip-Off. All the, sorry, Rip Off All the Way, All the British Way of Death, which I know is available at bookstores and um, Amazon and um, numerous other places. How's that gone for you? Um, moderately well. The selling books, uh, you probably know, is um, dire these days. Um, but uh, I've probably sold about 700 copies in Brilliant. there. Brilliant. Um, but that really is the story of natural burial. I decided to take all the objections I got from funeral directors and everybody and embroider it into a story that when somebody reads that book, by the end of it, they'll know all the inside information on the funeral business, how coffins are sold to you, um, what happens when um, post-mortems take place, the problems with obesity in actually lifting people's coffins up That's... and getting them into a grave or indeed into a cremator, yeah. uh, all those sort of issues, the way in which women are so powerful in that most in most situations, of course, the man dies first. I, I always say to uh, men when they used to come on talks with me, I'm sorry, but you're the weaker sex. Let me guarantee it. The statistics show it. You will die five, six, seven years earlier than your partner. But women also arrange funerals. You know, if I'd have a pound for every man who comes in and says, oh, you've just put my body in a black plastic sack and throw me over the wall. And I usually say, I haven't done a funeral like that. The women come in much more serious. Um, and so women are really important when it comes to funerals. And also, of course, there was a lot of the work I did in my early days was for stillbirths. Because the situation for burying stillbirths was so bad. When I first came in and I went through Shrewsbury and I finally I was managing at Wolverhampton. And we were putting 200 stillbirths into a single grave. Oh. And... So none of those stillbirths could be taken out. Nobody could visit the grave. And I finally put a proposal together where every stillbirth would be buried individually, got in touch with New Cross Hospital. And incidentally, Anne was working at New Cross Hospital, training to be a midwife at the time. Um, and I said to them, I'm going to change the process or I need to change the process. Took the post and said, the process has worked. It's time-honoured practice. Time-honoured practice was 1855 when that process had started. And so I had to write back to them and say, I'm not asking you any longer, I'm telling you. From this date onwards, we'll be doing the burials individually. Every stillbirth will be in an individual small grave. There'll be no charge made to you. And if a parent comes along and wants to visit the grave, they can do. Oh. And, and that virtually changed the process for stillbirth burial from that point onwards. Oh, yeah. um, so, uh, and, and that came because of women coming to see me and saying, it's appalling. You know, I, I suffered a stillbirth 20 years ago. I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. I left it to other people. And now I can't go back and, and honour that child in some way. Sure. Um, sure. And so I think it's that, that sort of comes back to talking to people uh, and understanding what goes on out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll put in the show notes um, all about the, the sites that you recommended. Um, uh, and I, I think, obviously, um, I'll put a link to your book. So if people are interested, they can get a they can uh, buy a copy of that. And, um, and I think the, the advice has to be is, is go out and find more, more about what's really going on so that you can actually plan with, a, with, with, with some, an informed choice. Yes, that is important. I, I think um, specifically because your partner should always know or your family precisely what you want. Most people don't understand that um, they can leave funeral directions, but of course uh, your executors can change those. They don't have to follow your wishes. So it's quite important that you've got agreement over what is going to happen. Because I have had people come back to me with natural burial and say, we're finding it, she wanted a cardboard coffin, but we're finding it really difficult to handle a cardboard coffin. 
And then I, I would say to them, look, you need to be comfortable with the funeral. And sometimes you don't have to go with the wishes of the deceased if you've really got a problem with it. Right. And, and try and, and get comfortable in that way. So have a conversation early and, uh, and make it clear exactly what you want. Absolutely. Talk about it. And if you can go out there and find a site, that is a really good idea. Um, I spoke to some um, Buddhists locally um, in Milton and um, they wanted natural burial, couldn't decide about choosing a site and then said, what about buying a piece of woodland on internet woodlands? Can I then do burials in there? And I said, yes, you can. There's no planning permission needed. A small number of family burials, particularly where you're not charging for them, you're not a business, there's no problem. So in fact, they bought a small chunk of the new forest over near Bewley. And now this Buddhist family and uh, some of the people that they're associated with go there for their sort of ceremonies and know that that's where they'll be buried, in amongst the trees. Marvellous. Brilliant. Now that's the type of planning I like. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Ken. And um, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you, Justin. Cheers. If you're new here, a very warm welcome to the show. I'm Justin King, a Chartered Financial Planner, Society of Later Life Accredited Advisor and author of Ready Steady Retire. This is a podcast from MFP Wealth Management, a firm of Chartered Financial Planners helping people in and around Christchurch in Dorset to retire with complete financial confidence. That's what this podcast, The Retirement Cafe, is all about. You can find out more about the podcast, listen to the back catalogue of episodes and find the show notes for this episode at theretirementcafe.co.uk forward slash episode two. You can also visit Ken West's blog to find out more about his latest ventures at stonehengepensioner.com. A big thank you to Ken West MBE for joining me for this episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. What a fascinating insight into the little known world of natural burial from the leading expert in the field the only person ever to be awarded an MBE for contributions to bereavement services. You can find the show notes for this episode, along with some useful links at theretirementcafe.co.uk, episode two. And let me know what you think about the points we discussed in this episode. You can drop me a line at jk at mfpwealthmanagement.co.uk, or you can connect on Twitter at Justin King CFP. Until next time, this is Justin King, helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk.